Boxing is a sport of violence. The aspects of its beauty are forever intertwined with its brutality. Bloody knuckles, busted lips, and broken bones are all par for the course on the way to the most definite and emphatic conclusion in all of sport, the knockout. That conclusion has been the goal for over a hundred years and why boxing is one of the most exciting, nerve-wracking, money-generating spectacles on earth. But while the sweet science has remained mainly unchanged since the inclusion of gloves in 1867, in 2019, the sports landscape has shifted. No longer are battered boxers simply having their bell rung. They are suffering concussions. Whoa. Old warriors aren't punchy. They are brain damaged. And deaths in the ring aren't just unfortunate occurrences. They are the obvious side effect of repetitive head trauma, fighters put in situations where they were too tough to stop themselves and when no one else did. The sport's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I think people uh, understand that people get hurt in the sport. You can only do so much. I can't get in the ring and, and fight for them, right? Uh, I can do my homework to make sure that everyone's medical properly, that everyone's in, in good health, and know when to pull the plug for them. And because a lot of these guys, they'll fight to the death. Um, and, and fortunately, there hasn't been a tragedy that has happened on one of my cards. Um, listen, it's odds. It's inevitable. If I do this for the next 40 years, I'm sure there will be some dark moments. Um, but that's something that I sign up for, and that's something the fighters sign up for. It is a lot of weight to hold on your shoulders, but you, it comes with the territory. We go in there knowing the risks. We go in there knowing all this stuff. We're okay with it, but of course you got your family, you got your coaches, your you know other people that are thinking of you. So. Uh, think that the coaches and the, the referees sometimes should, should make that call when there's no chance of you winning. We spoke to a variety of experts to see how Canada can and will make this noble yet destructive sport safer and how we can stop these warriors from taking one punch too many. What is a traumatic brain injury? A TBI is caused when an external force injures the brain and is classified by its severity. An internal skull injury that is caused by a force shaking or twisting the brain is called a concussion. These brain injuries have many symptoms, including dizziness, nausea, issues with sleep patterns, speech, thought processes, and motor function, and can be linked to life-changing disorders, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE. Dr. Carmela Tartaglia is a cognitive neurologist working for the University Health Network out of Toronto, as well as a clinical scientist for the TAN Center for Research on Neurodegenerative Diseases. Her research has called for better funding to establish a definitive link between multiple concussions and CTE. The one that the athletes are most worried about is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is what they found in many football players and boxers and soccer players. Um, and we don't have a test for that. Definitely the number one risk factor for chronic traumatic encephalopathy is repetitive head injuries. So we're not seeing it very much in the people who've only had one injury, but uh, right now the biggest risk factor seems to be repetitive hits to the head. And so a lot of times people are left wondering, so what's the cause of the change that I'm experiencing or that my family or friends are noticing? We're not seeing that everybody gets this. So Definitely, right? There seems to be some people that are vulnerable, and that's like everything, right? Not everybody gets cancer. You know, everybody knows smokers who did this their whole lives and didn't die of cancer. Our genetics and the interaction between our genetics and our environment, you know, give you different vulnerability and resiliency factors, you know? And the thing is that we actually don't have any good markers to say that your brain is healed. So even when you feel 100%, you had a concussion, and you feel like, no, I'm, I feel really good now, I feel like I'm back to myself, but I don't know if your brain's back to yourself, because we know that the brain can compensate. So maybe your brain's just compensating for any deficits that are there, you're not noticing that your brain's not 100% healed. It's not like when you stub your toe, right, or break something. The next time you get a concussion, it's gonna be on an unhealed brain. So it's very, very tough. Um, and that's why we, we do promote prevention. And I know it's very tough for some sports because 
the sport itself entails hits the head. Dr. Nora Cullen is the Chief of Staff at West Park Healthcare Center in Toronto. She's been working exclusively in the rehabilitation of brain injured adults since 1998 and in 2019 was chosen to be the president of the International Brain Injury Association's World Congress on Brain Injury. The notion that we need to just suck it up, uh, you, you've had a bell ringer and that's okay, you'll, go, you'll get over it. That notion no longer is okay. I look at them as a whole person and try to determine how is this injury impacting on their day-to-day -day life and how can we maximize their, their, their function in day-to-day -day life. What we do believe is it's not so much the number of head injuries, but the amount of time between those head injuries. So if you've been injured on a, in a certain month and you uh, are injured again the next month, that would be considered very close uh, timeline. And you haven't fully recovered from the first one when the second one hits you. And that becomes much more difficult to recover from. If, however, it was two years later, you might find that it's not really a big problem. You know, I think it really is dependent on the symptoms the individual's having. You might have three concussions and be fine. Another person may have one concussion and not be fine. So really, uh, it's about what is the cluster of symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, certainly, the more you hit blows to the head you have, the more likely you are to have one that will not, you will not recover from quite as quickly. The human brain can only take so much. And, and those impacts, each one, are uh, when you think about the billions of neurons that you have in your brain, every time you get knocked out, you're losing a whole cluster of those neurons. You can't keep doing that and still expect to be normal at the end of the, what, the season or the, the career or whatever it is. I would say that the fewer blows, the better. Jeff Brooks is the Director of Operations at Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada, while also completing his doctorate degree in kinesiology, focusing on subconcussive impacts. His interest in brain trauma developed through his 12 years of football experience through high school and Western University. I have never been diagnosed with a concussion. Uh, however, knowing so much about concussions now, I can certainly think of a few instances where uh, looking back, you know, there's one time I came off the field, everything was a weird shade of blue um, for about 10 minutes. Uh, so knowing that now, I know for sure that that is a sign of uh, most likely a concussion. Uh, however, you know, never spoke up about it, wasn't really on my radar or something to be worried about. So I never told anyone. Um, and I certainly know many teammates uh, who received them. Uh, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. Uh, concussions can and will happen. Uh, you can educate some people as much as, you, know, you can give them all the information, but it's, it's how they choose to perceive it. So some people have that old school attitude still where it's, uh, you get hurt, rub some dirt on it and get back in there. I think constant hitting is definitely bad for sure. Um, and that's why it's so important to be aware of, you know, uh, or cognizant of how many impacts a player is taking. And it's hard when the nature of a sport is to impact one another, but there are a lot of things that you can do to uh, lessen the blows. So, you know, you have those athletes who, yeah, they'll live and die by whatever sport they play, which you kind of have to work through your way into their heads is the fact that no matter, you know, if you, if you are the elite of the elite and you are that 1% who makes it to the professional level, you're still going to be retired by mid thirties uh, early 40s if you're extremely lucky and you know injury free and whatnot and at early 40s you've still got half your life if not more to go and uh, you need a healthy brain to do that and uh, it's just it's a difficult conversation but some sometimes you have to put it in that kind of harder harder way to, for them to see it I don't think getting hit over and over is a good thing for the brain I do not think our brains were designed for that and there is no protection we can offer because all these helmets will not protect you against concussion. There's no way to protect your brain against the jiggle that happens when something hits your head. Knowing what a traumatic brain injury is, is one thing, but what are we actually doing about them? Apart from continued research, various organizations like the Ontario Neuro Trauma Foundation set forth concussion prevention guidelines. And in 2019, the government of Ontario released Rowan's Law, 
This legislation, named after 17-year-old Rowan Stringer, who died as a result of a head injury sustained while playing high school rugby, governs all organized amateur sport by forcing concussion education, codes of conduct, and strict return to learn and return to play guidelines. With Rowan's law, what they've done is, it's Ontario specific, so you know, we're still obviously working on a Canada-wide um, uh, law, but in Ontario specifically, I believe it's all schools as of this coming September need to have some sort of concussion protocol in place, both from a return to play perspective. So if someone gets hurt, they need to go through the proper steps to make sure they're returning when they are able to, not too soon, and then return to learn as well. So they're returning to school because, you know, a injured brain uh, can't even necessarily process information correctly and being in a school setting can sometimes make things much worse. From a sport side of things, all sport organizations also need uh, some sort of concussion protocol in place. We talk about, you know, what a concussion is, why they're important, and why even kids should care about them. Um, when we especially uh, look at things like, you know, looking out for your teammates. Um, if someone has a brain injury, then by definition, they can't think properly. So it's likely that they aren't able to report themselves or they may not even realize something's wrong. So that's why you as a teammate or a classmate or a friend need to look out for um, your buddy. I'm hoping people are aware. I mean, as you know, in Ontario, we have Rowan's Law that just passed uh, not that long ago. So I think there's concussion legislation now. So people have to be aware. People have to be educated. Uh, everybody who has sports, who's involved in sports, needs to have education about this. So I think more people are aware. And I do think that when people have a change in their cognition, in their behavior, they do look for answers. You know, I mean, even if you have a cough for a few weeks or a month, somebody's gonna say like, what's the cause of my cough? And they're gonna go seek medical advice. Well, think of if your personality changed, if your thinking and memory changed, and if you're not noticing it, somebody around you is gonna notice and, and bring that to somebody's attention. The knowledge is slowly coming out. Uh, there's post-concussion uh, guidelines that have come out from the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. So obviously the, the knowledge is getting out there and we're trying to translate that knowledge so that people uh, are having access to the services that they need. There's a, you know, a recognition now that psychiatric problems, so neuropsychological problems after concussion are quite rampant. And uh, accessing the right uh, services is really problematic. And so I think, you know, there's a move towards changing that. It's, you know, it's not unusual to end up in a depression or with great, great anxiety after you get a concussion. I think that the approach to head injuries has improved. Um, interestingly, the number of concussed people that we see are many more than it was 10 years ago. That's and that's not to say that it, it's, a, uh, it's a real increase in number, it's just a, probably an increase in reporting. So people are more aware of it, they're more likely to seek treatment, and when they do, it goes into the, the, the numbers. So, so we're, we're seeing a lot more of this. Yeah, I mean, boxing is that sport. I mean, it seems like in the media nowadays, like you're hearing so many, um, so many things that are happening and you know boxing boxers getting injured or you know the few that that have passed away in the last little bit um, so it's definitely scary when you're when you're seeing that um, but so I think I think it's causing people to have you know to take um, a different look at their training what they're doing in the gym I think weight making weight plays into that as well and I, I also do think there's a bit of an education piece that does need to happen for coaching right because not all the coaches are you know certified to the highest standard or uh, you know for boxing a lot of times it's just a volunteer that's just an interest in boxing maybe watches it on tv and says hey like you know i want to just work with the kids and get the kids off the street and you know so sometimes making sure that they're properly educated on on different protocols um, to look for with head injury i think would be would be important Boxing, I think by definition, will never be safe because you're seeking to give them a brain injury. Um, by knocking them out, that's one of the ways we measure brain injury. They've been knocked out. Though Ontario and Canada as a whole are taking measures to increase TBI research and education, there are still limitations. 
when it gets down to sports federations, um, you're dealing with a lot of money. There is a lot of money at stake and, and there is going to be backlash when it comes to them changing their rules and regulations of the sport. Rehabilitation is slow to change, but uh, I think over time I've, I've seen because of the greater awareness, there's, great, there's more funding. I think that we've, we're making progress in that regard. The um, government funded uh, therapies are, are stretched in, in, on every level of, of healthcare. Um, you know, there's been a lot more emphasis on funding uh, cancer, funding heart disease, and funding the brain has really not received the same kind of attention. And so we're, we're far behind these other fields. Canada is making strides in TBI research and education, but there is still a long way to go. Immediate tests that could determine if an athlete had suffered a TBI would be the ultimate advancement, and tech companies are working towards this goal. SportFits is an independent company out of Waterloo, Ontario, and is working on the development of technology that could detect brain injuries as they happen. So it's a one inch brain impact, body motion, biometric, wearable device. So that means you actually wear it, you put it on your head and wear it. So what it does is it tells you in real time if your brain has hit your head inside with the accelerometers in it and then your biometrics. So we have a pulse oximeter here and the pulse oximeter reads the, the um, pulse and the oxygen flowing through your neck. It also determines body motion because we have other hardware inside gyroscopes and uh, magnetometers that indicate your position. People don't realize in terms of brain impact if their brain's been impacted. So the end goal of that is simply to save lives. Is if you can determine and if you wearing this device know in real time that your brain has been altered and hit your head, then we can, we can get medical attention immediately and it will save your life. There is a lot of work being done to educate athletes on the dangers of brain trauma, but what can be done now to specifically help boxers? For boxers, the first line of defense happens in the gym. And in the gym, the biggest issue is sparring. As discussed, repetitive hits to the head can do more long-term damage than one big impact. So, it makes sense to take less punishment to the brain by limiting sparring. Now, sparring is an essential part of training, and it is necessary to mimic real fight situations and teach defense. But it is the amount of sparring that needs to be controlled. You really have to be smart about, you know, how many rounds you're doing in sparring, you know, what that sparring looks like, you know, when, when we're training it's and we're actually in the ring sparring, it's usually, we're working on something, right? It's not just to throw punches and, you know, get those rounds in, and I think a lot of people are still doing that. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's definitely precautions that need to be take, taken in, in boxing, as there are in every, every um, sport where there's contact. I always plan for the future, and I know boxing is not um, going to be something I do forever. So yeah, I know that it's kind of, this is coming to an end eventually, and you have to think of life beyond, beyond boxing. I used to spar all the time before, but uh, as I made the transition into a professional, we, we don't spar as much as I used to spar before. I think it's, it's, it's a good way, but of course you need to spar because it's like hitting a bag, hitting pads is one thing. You could be good at it, but when you get in the ring, you could forget about what you did. So it's like, so sparring is very important, but it depends how long do you spar with and who do you spar with? Do you take a lot of punishment? If you take a lot of punishment, then you should not spar as much. I think um, if you can reduce the amount of uh, hits to the head in sparring, um, I think that would go a long ways because uh, in football you can have up to 70-75% of head impacts occur during practice and I would assume it's going to be something similar in boxing where you know to train you have, you have to be you want to train at your highest level um, however it's a question is of our hits to the head in while training are they actually helping a boxer you know can you still get your footwork in your hand speed work that kind of thing without taking hits to the head um, and you know sometimes there will be maybe intense bouts where you do take a few hits instead of a daily occurrence and i think that could go a long way 
athletic commissions and governing bodies are trying to make the sport safer. But when it comes to life and death, they need to do better. It is better to stop a fight a couple punches too early than one punch too late. Better training for officials and stricter medical regulations are just the beginning. Since there are no exact tests at the moment, more stringent measures need to take place. For example, mandatory pre- and post-fight brain scans and MRIs for all fighters. A flashlight to the eyes is not enough, and post-fight celebrations can wait. In boxing, victors take damage as well. Sometimes a boxer could be so hard-headed, so tough, that even though he's hurt, he could just be like, I'm okay, I'm not hurt, you know. His body could be telling him that he's okay, but he doesn't know maybe somewhere deep inside he's hurt, you know. After a fight, maybe MRIs maybe could be a good thing because it'll show if there's a little problem and it'll prevent him from making it worse, from maybe going back to training next week, you know, where he should, whereas he should take a couple of weeks off. And if they are, you know, if there's a change from after the fight to before the fight, then there's probably been some sort of injury to the head. So making sure you're watching the athlete, giving them that time to rest, maybe continuing to monitor those tests that you ran and then wait till they've come back to their, their normal bit. And then, then they kind of get the go ahead to start training again. But the single most important thing that can be done is for boxers, trainers, officials, and commissions to educate themselves on the risks of brain trauma so that these warriors who literally put their lives on the line can live to fight another day. And in the end, live a full life once the fighting is through. As most of us know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So anytime you learn new things and you try to implement them for you know, change, I think you're moving in the right direction. Uh, doesn't mean you don't have far to go, but at least it's the right direction. I think it's not about banning sports necessarily, but making sure you're adapting to changes. Um, so you know, players are getting bigger and faster, so you need to adjust rules and policies around that. Um, and then the awareness is a big one so that players know if they're injured to speak up about it so that they can take that time to recover. And I would offer this word of advice, protect your head whenever you have the opportunity. Don't take silly risks, you don't get another brain. And once you damage it, it's really hard for it to recover. I mean, I heard, of course, there's always people that put the health aside because they need money, you know, they, they need to, to live some way. You could understand them some way because it's, how do I say it? It's their decision, it's their choice. But then again, of course, maybe they're not thinking about, about the people that care for them. You know, they're doing it, uh, making the decision themselves. But then a boxer is, is a boxer, you know? He will, <laughs> I think any boxer that loves to box and, 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 and does it, will will always go you know forward say no i'm okay i'll keep going so it's it's a hard call